<laughs> so I'm going to try and um, give you a, a, a really helpful, hopefully, overview of the science of dementia. Um, as Hayley said, some of the progress, the really exciting progress that we're making in dementia research and also some of the key work that we're doing at the Outside Society hopefully um, convince you or reconvince you that we are at the forefront of efforts in trying to find new ways to cure, uh, treat and prevent dementia in the future. Um, and there will be time for questions at the end, so anything goes within reason for questions, so do note your questions down and we'll um, try our best to answer them. So I don't think I need to tell you guys that this is a really, really exciting time for dementia. There's a huge amount of attention out there, which is really, really great, and not least a lot of attention in the media. In fact, can I have a show of hands uh, from people who have heard anything about dementia in the media in the last week? Yeah, OK, now that's good. You read your papers <coughs> and your BBC online, that's good. Um, out of those of you that have read something in the media, put your hands up if you think you have believed every single word that you have read. <laughs> Good, that worked. So that's the right answer. And for the benefit of the film, nobody put their hand up for that one. Um, I mean, what's brilliant is that we have got a lot of attention on dementia. We've got lots of people focusing on it. There's awareness that's increasing. People are going to their GPs more than ever if they're worried about their memory, which is fantastic. And we're seeing more funding and more political priority coming into uh, dementia, which is, is what we need and what we want. However, there can sometimes be a little bit of a downside. And some of the headlines and the stories, you know, some here, but also others that you will have read, are slightly less fact and evidence based and it can lead to false hope <coughs> which is not great I mean, if you read some papers there's a cure for Alzheimer's every week which um, is not a good thing for people to be reading because that is false hope but there can also be some misconceptions about what actually causes dementia you know there was a headline that uh, we're talking about being able to catch dementia at your dentist absolutely <laughs> not um, the case so we do a lot of work to try and um, uh, get rid of those myths and, and tell people the real facts behind um, the stories. So unfortunately, the whole blueberries, the curries, the broccolis, probably not going to make uh, much difference to your risk of uh, developing dementia. But I'll come on to those risk factors um, later <coughs> on. But on the whole, the fact that we have this attention on dementia is a very, very good thing. Um, but as Hayley said, I'm going to try and go through some of the facts with you today and dispel some of the myths that are out there. Um, so some facts and figures on dementia again. Many of you will be um, aware of these facts and figures. Um, unfortunately, yes, dementia is on the rise um, and it's really mainly due to the fact we're, we're all living longer. So the biggest risk, risk factor for dementia is age. So we are living longer, so more and more people are developing dementia. If we look at the UK, um, there are around 850,000 people with dementia today in the UK. That number, we think, will rise to over a million by 2021 and potentially could rise to over 2 million by 2051 if we were to do nothing around prevention and treatment. And if we look globally, 50 million people across the world um, have dementia today, that number increasing to 130 million by 2050. So these numbers are big. If we look at the economic cost of dementia, it's £26.3 billion per year to the UK economy, and that's twice the cost of cancer, three times the cost of heart disease. Globally, dementia is estimated to cost the global economy one trillion US dollars every year, which to put that in context, if dementia was a country, it would be in the G20. It would have the 18th largest economy in the world. So some really hard-hitting um, statistics about, the, the, about, about, about dementia today, but also moving into the future. Um, also, unfortunately, um, recently dementia has become the leading cause of death in the UK. Um, medical research, which is good news, has helped um, find new treatments and cures, ways of preventing heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancers, um, and that means we have seen a reduction in deaths from uh, those conditions. Um, but at the same time, with this living longer and we don't have any treatments to be able to slow, stop or prevent dementia, uh, dementia is now the leading cause of death in the UK. I mean, essentially what's happened is 
from a medical research perspective, we've got very good at curing and treating uh, diseases that affect our body neck downwards. We need to be able to catch up to be able to treat um, and hopefully cure diseases that affect the brain so that we can see that curve going in the same direction as those with um, uh, diabetes, heart disease and stroke. Um, so those statistics, they're not there to scaremonger, um, but they're there to really tell the true story of dementia. And this is incredibly important because for us to get traction, to get um, interest, to get uh, more funding and priority from government, uh, raise awareness in general public, we have to be honest about the scale of dementia. So those statistics are really important because we're not um, scaremongering, we're not putting spin on it. Actually, we need to tell the real story of, of dementia. When it comes to um, medical research, as I said, we don't currently have a treatment that can slow or stop dementia in its tracks. It's a thing that we are absolutely aiming for. And there are a number of reasons why that is the case. Now, funding into research is absolutely one of the key reasons why we have not seen the progress in dementia research compared to other disease areas. We've had decades of underfunding in dementia research. If we compare to cancer research, we are currently seeing for every pound invested in, cancer, in, in dementia research, we see six pounds invested in cancer research. If we look at the output from research, so this isn't the perfect measure, but it's a good measure to show how much research is going on. Looking at papers over the last 60 or 70 years, so these are research papers that are published in academic scientific journals. For every one that's been published on dementia, 20 have been published on cancer. So there's a huge amount we need to do because we are seeing the progress in cancer and there's a bit of catch up that uh, we, we need to do when it comes to dementia. If we look at the number of researchers, one researcher for every four cancer researchers. Now the good news is the tide is starting to turn and we, we are turning that tide from the Alzheimer's Society perspective. Back 10 years ago, there was only one researcher for every eight um, cancer researchers. Now it's one to four. Still not where we want it to be, but we are making um, significant progress. And, and the comparison to cancer is a really important one. And we can look at other disease areas as well. But cancer is arguably the biggest success story when it comes to medical research. And the progress that we've seen in cancer research because of the funding that's gone into it, there's no reason why we can't see the same for dementia. In fact, we are confident that we can see the same for dementia. So, what do we know about the science of dementia? Well, the good news is we know quite a lot um, and our knowledge has increased significantly in the last five or six years. Now, what we do know is that the brain is incredibly complex. It's the most complex thing in the universe known to us. There's over 100 billion nerve cells in the brain, which means there are over 100 trillion connections within the brain where all these messages are, are shooting around, making our body move, making our memories, creating our personalities. And what happens is dementia attacks the connections between the nerve cells and by attacking those upsets the chemical balance, which means the brain cells become damaged and we end up losing brain cells and we see a shrinkage in the brain. So the picture here um, is a, a picture of, of two brain samples from two different brains. Now um, researchers refer to the one on the left as a healthy brain, um, but it doesn't look very healthy to me because it's a brain section from somebody who's actually died. Um, but, um, but what it means is actually there's no dementia. That person did not die of dementia. So this is what we would expect from uh, a brain of, of somebody without dementia. On the right is a section of a brain from somebody who did have dementia. And you can, it doesn't take me to point out the, the fact that there is that shrinkage that's happening. So what we need to do, we need to understand the brain in a lot of detail so that we can try and prevent this shrinkage from happening. Um, another uh, part of the science and, and a common question, in fact, I had the question just over the, the drinks in the other room is, you know, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And it's a very common question. You can be forgiven if you've asked it, you want to ask it, or if you're, you're thinking of it, because it's unfortunately, it's quite complicated and, and from a sort of clinical perspective, we like these complicated things. Um, but what, what we need to be describing to people is actually there is a difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, in summary, dementia is the umbrella term that describes the symptoms that people experience. So it's the memory loss, it's the personality changes, it's the um, challenge with the executive function. So it's, it's known as the syndrome 
and dementia is caused by diseases of the brain and Alzheimer's disease is the most common it's about two-thirds of cases of dementia are Alzheimer's disease uh, but there are a number of other um, more common forms or uh, more common diseases that cause dementia so vascular dementia dementia Lewy bodies frontotemporal dementia um, but overall there's over a hundred different diseases now the others are very very rare and affect very small proportions of people um, in the country um, but hopefully that's kind of un, uh, un, un sort of masked the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's so it's the syndrome and brain diseases cause dementia um, so what is happening in the brain um, lots of different things happen so there are these different diseases but many of them all come back to the fact that the proteins in our brain are not behaving how they should. And these are proteins that exist in all of our brains, but in brains of people with dementia, they're misbehaving. Now, there's amyloid and there's tau. They may be proteins that you've read about in the press, you've seen um, in reports that we've, we've sent you from the Alzheimer's Society. These are the two main proteins that are, are really the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Um, amyloid is a protein that's found in our brain, as I say, um, and this clumps outside of the brain cells. Tau is a, is a protein that's found in your cells and it clumps inside your cells and that clumping damages the cells and we see a loss um, of brain cells and we, we see progression of Alzheimer's disease. There are other proteins, so Lewy bodies are deposits that are left in the brain um, and uh, they're often seen in people with Parkinson's but uh, in people with dementia with Lewy bodies as well. And down on the bottom is a nice little brain picture showing how the immune system that's present in the brain is responding to these uh, proteins that are aggregating that they are clumping. And there's uh, stories around the immune system being good in trying to clear some of those clumps um, but there's also evidence to show that maybe that immune reaction isn't great and it can lead to some of the progression so we're starting to really understand the protein biology um, in the brain um, and trying to understand how these different diseases work now one exception to this is vascular dementia that's not caused by proteins that clump together that's caused by the blood vessels um, um, malfunctioning um, which means the blood doesn't get to parts of the brain as well as it should so it's not delivering oxygen and nutrients and then we see um, a loss of the brain cells uh, from that perspective but vast majority are caused by these proteins that misfold they're misbehaving and it's a, a huge area of research going forwards now dementia is complex the brain is complex what else is complex is that a lot of people have mixed dementia, so they might not just have Alzheimer's, they may have Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, lots of complexity, but that doesn't stop us from a research perspective. Actually, it spurs us on, it's, it's bring it on. We can really take the, these observations, look at them in detail and get some real answers as to what's going on in the brain and turn those answers into ways for, of treating dementia in the future. So lots of things are happening uh, from a research perspective. I'll just go through some of those um, now. Um, so what we really want to be aiming for, for dementia, is to identify what's called a disease modifying treatment. So these are treatments that act on the mechanisms in the brain to slow or stop those mechanisms so that we don't see progression of, um, of dementia. Now I think there might be a pointer here. Ah, yeah, there is. Um, so this graph is aiming to try and tease out the different types of treatments that we can have. So up here is your cognition, and this is a number of years following uh, onset of dementia. And if, if we have, generally, because everybody's dementia is very, very different, everyone else's Alzheimer's is very, very different, um, what we would see is over time, a gradual reduction in, in, in cognition, um, if it's untreated. Now we do have a couple of treatments for Alzheimer's disease that treat the symptoms. They are known as symptomatic treatments. And what they do is they alleviate some of the symptoms for a time-limited period. So what we would see um, is actually cognition improving and that then we see the cognition reducing but in a delayed way compared to people who are untreated. However, over time, people will then tend to uh, revert to the normal progression. So for this period here, people um, are seeing effects from the treatment but actually it's, it's not getting to the nub of the issue in the brain um, so the, the disease does progress at, at the same rate. What we want to be developing is this disease modifying treatment and we want this decline to be as, as shallow as possible. You know, Ideally we want something that's going to stop 
dementia progressing completely. And these are treatments that don't, don't um, treat the symptoms, they don't just act on the chemicals in the brain, actually they act on the nerve cells or the really important mechanisms that cause dementia and different forms, uh, different diseases causing dementia um, and slow down that progression over time. And it's a global ambition. Some of you may have seen from the G8, which turned to the G7 pretty quickly after the summit in 2013, um, that there's a global ambition to be finding one or more of these treatments by 2025. And we're, we are optimistic that we can do that. And hopefully I can convince you that's the case with the next few slides. Now, we don't have this treatment. It's not for the sort of lack of trying. Um, this graph is really showing um, uh, the success rate of, um, of lab research that comes in at the top of the funnel and what drugs come out <coughs> at the end of clinical trials. And if we're looking at hepatitis C, um, we're looking at MRSA and the industry average, um, there's you know, about sort of between two and four and a half percent success from research that goes into a clinical pipeline and drugs that come out. <coughs> Unfortunately for Alzheimer's disease, 99.5% um, of clinical trials have failed. And there have been a huge number of these preclinical studies um, that have, some have got through to phase one, but unfortunately they have failed during the clinical trials process. Now, lots of reasons why that's the case, and I'm gonna tease out some of those. Um, actually, we've probably been doing trials in the wrong people. We've been going too late on um, in, in the disease process. We've been focusing on one, maybe two different targets. Actually, we've got to um, broaden that. So lots of learning taken from this. Um, and we're now doing research better, we're doing clinical trials better, and we're targeting more parts of the brain. So we're confident that we can really act on this success rate and bring it up to the industry average, if not beyond, to be developing new treatments for dementia. Um, so there have been lots of progress. I'll be here all night, all day, tomorrow and all night again tomorrow if I talk to everything. But if I had to pick three of my favourite um, areas of, of progress, they, they, they would be these. The first one is not related to this image, but it was a discovery that came out four or five years ago that showed the changes in the brain um, of people with Alzheimer's disease start happening about 10 to 15 years before someone develops their first symptom of Alzheimer's, which is a fantastic discovery because it opens up a whole new avenue of research. We know that these changes happen in the brain. The brain can compensate for 10, 15, maybe even 20 years before someone has their first memory loss symptom. And, and that's fantastic because that means if we can identify those people, we can start looking at those early processes and try and identify um, treatments to target those processes that will be helpful for people with diagnosed Alzheimer's disease. But what's very exciting, it could open up the opportunity that we can prevent dementia from developing in the first place. So if we're able to come in with a treatment in midlife, if we can identify someone who is at risk and those changes are starting to happen, we could prevent dementia from uh, developing in later life. And we liken this to um, heart disease um, and the treatment with statin. So in our midlife, we go for our cholesterol tests. If our cholesterol's high, we're given a statin to try and reduce our chance of developing um, heart disease in later life. That's exactly what we could be aiming for from uh, for, for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. And that discusses why that discovery is so exciting because um, it does open up that opportunity as something that, that we are exploiting. The second discovery that's really, really exciting, and this is the image here. So um, what we have here is the control brain. So this is the sort of healthy brain, so non-Alzheimer brain, um, and AD is Alzheimer's disease. The, the colorful bits here are the amyloid protein that I talked to in the, uh, in the slide a couple of slides ago. Um, and what we've been doing, and the reason why a number of these clinical trials have failed in the past, is recruiting people with Alzheimer's disease into trials, testing these drugs to see if they work. Now we've gone back to those trials now that we have this new technology. So for the first time in recent years, we've been able to use what's called a tracer to get into the brain and take pictures on a scanner to show that people do definitely have amyloid in their brain. And we've not really been able to do that um, at scale until recent years. So we've gone back to old clinical trials and, and looking at people and actually seeing that a lot of people who are in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease drugs didn't have amyloid in their brain, which means they didn't have Alzheimer's disease, which 
probably is then it's, it's obvious why that trial didn't work. So we were possibly throwing baby out with the bathwater because we were identifying the wrong people to go to this trial. So now we can identify these people. The trials are focusing on the people who could uh, potentially benefit from these treatments. And so we'll have a bigger success, um, hopefully, of identifying uh, something new. The third discovery um, uh, that you know, actually covers a, a number of different discoveries is that we are diversifying the target. So we are understanding more about the brain and we're putting more molecules into clinical trial that are targeting different parts um, of the brain and potentially of the rest of the body. So a lot of the effort is looked at amyloid to date. We've now got some uh, drugs in trial for the tau protein, so that's the other one for Alzheimer's disease. Um, we've got researchers looking at the immune system because that looks really important in, uh, in various forms of dementia. Um, we've got people looking at and how the proteins fold, misfold, how they're not behaving to try and stop that from happening. We've also got researchers looking at gut bacteria and believe it or not, that could affect our uh, brains and, uh, and the progression of dementia. So lots of really exciting stuff, um, which is all pointing towards us making much more progress more quickly than we have ever done before. <coughs> so what is the Alzheimer's Society doing? Well, you would hope, expect us to be at the forefront. And again, hopefully I'm going to convince you that uh, that is the case. Now, I don't have to talk to the Alzheimer's Society, I'm sure, at any length as a whole. We're a really unique organisation. It's a fantastic organisation to work for because we don't just fund the research because we are supporting people with dementia now and we're looking to have that societal change. So the three main things that we're doing, that we, we are the largest provider of support for people with dementia and their carers across um, the country, either face-to-face -face or remotely through our helpline, through our website. Um, we're campaigning for change globally, nationally, regionally, also locally, getting you know, the dementia movement happening uh, at the, the grassroots level. We've got our Dementia Friends program, fantastic at raising awareness and, and really transforming communities so people with dementia can live in their community of choice for as long as possible. Um, and then there's the, the funding, uh, the research program, which has been really exciting. I've been at society, as Heli said, for the last five years. We've more than quadrupled our investment thanks to the generosity you know, of you guys and others that are supporting uh, the society. Um, and we're doing some really exciting things in there. So uh, it's great that we do all of this because there are synergies between the different parts of, of the organisation and we're looking to exploit those as much as possible. So what are we doing uh, from a research perspective? Well, ultimately we're aiming for this. We're looking for improved diagnosis, treatment, services support and prevention. Um, essentially, we want these new drugs coming through and better ways of providing care and support. The way we are trying to deliver on that with our research programme is that we're taking a dual approach across care and cure. So we're funding research into both of those um, different areas to try and speed up the whole of the research process. We've got three, four main priorities within our programme. We're looking to really build the research capacity. There aren't enough researchers, as I said, earlier, we wanted to bring more researchers in to be working on the problem. We want to be taking really novel, innovative approaches that are high risk that other funders are, of research aren't going to be taking. We're looking, well we are taking a uh, different novel approach to try and identify new treatments. It's called repurposing and I'll talk a little bit about that. And um, we're also looking to accelerate bringing through new ways of caring and providing support for people affected by, deme uh, by dementia. So looking at um, the capacity, we are looking to, and in fact we are creating the next generation of dementia researchers in the UK. Um, I, I gave you all of these stats earlier on, so I said one to four compared to cancer. If you put that um, in relation to the cost of dementia um, versus the cost of cancer, it's actually one to 10 of cancer researchers. So there's a huge gap that we need to be um, addressing. And we're, we're really making progress um, on this through our groundbreaking uh, Dementia Research Leaders Programme at the Alzheimer's Society. And this is essentially where we're trying to attract, but also retain the very best brains in dementia research. So we're, we're offering competitive funding uh, from undergraduate stage, so getting them sort of really young and fresh while they're still at university and interested in dementia research. Um, but all the way through to sort of early and mid-stage uh, career fellows, not just providing funding, actually providing the softer stuff around that, which is really important to be developing research leaders of the future. 
We're offering mentorship, we're offering training, networking, collaboration skills so that people in academia are clued up, they're skilled up so that they can become group and research leaders themselves in the future. We've got some really exciting things happening. So we funded eight doctoral training centres across the UK back in 2015. That brought over 50 PhD students to the field. What was great about that as well is that actually the universities decided to come in partnership with us um, and of those 50 or so PhDs, actually 20 were funded by the different universities, which was fantastic to get that kind of support and, you know, and the leverage, making our donors your money work as hard as it can uh, within the context of our research programme. And we've got the UK Dementia Research Institute that I'll talk to in a little bit. It's bringing in 700 new scientists uh, to uh, the field. So some really exciting things happening from a, uh, a capacity um, perspective. Um, from the novel early stage innovative research, again, we've been leading the way. This is just one example, but a really nice example of how we are taking risks in, in, in areas of research. So looking at um, really different blue skies research, you know, one in 10 of these projects might succeed, nine in 10 may fail, but the one in 10 that succeeds will transform the whole of the research field, which is what happened with this project. So back in 2009, we awarded a grant to Professor Clive Holmes. He thought there was some connection between Alzheimer's disease and infections and wanted to look at it in a little bit more detail. That showed that there was a connection. And then he took it to the next stage and found that the immune system was important and this chemical in the immune system, TNF-alpha, that's called, um, seemed to be important in Alzheimer's disease. So he looked out there, said, well, are there any existing drugs that will target TNF-alpha? Found a rheumatoid arthritis drug and has now taken it into a major clinical trial um, and um, which is being funded mainly, but it's a multi-million euro clinical trial, um, mainly being funded by the EU and in, but in partnership with us. So we've gone from funding you know, a relatively small grant to stimulate this whole new area of research that's now come through to a clinical trial, which is a really good example. And actually, outside of this, the whole field has changed. So research groups from around the world are now looking at different parts of the immune system to see how important and whether we can uh, treat it for people with Alzheimer's disease. And believe it or not, this, this approach actually leads to slightly more fact-based headlines as well in some of the newspapers, which is quite nice to see. It's quite nice to see. Um, the third priority we got is our drug discovery program. As I said it was uh, a different approach that we're taking, looking to repurpose <coughs> treatments that are used for other conditions and see if they work in the lab for different models of dementia. And if they do, then we can go into clinical trials. And we've been running this program for about five or six years now. Um, and it's been hugely successful because we're starting to see the progression of these different studies coming through. And Professor Giovanna Malucci up in Cambridge, she's actually a, uh, one of the professors that are working in the UK Dementia Research Institute as well. Uh, but we funded some really exciting research um, uh, from her lab, um, looking at that sort of why the proteins are misfolding um, and how we may be able to keep cells alive in the brain even though these proteins are misfolding. Funded that early research, then uh, she did a, a, a screen of lots of different drug libraries and found that potentially a relatively commonly used uh, antidepressant called trazodone might act on this pathway and might trigger a particular bit of the pathway that can keep brain cells alive for longer, which could slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So some really exciting stuff. We're now in discussion with her about uh, clinical research as the next stage. Um, we've also, for a couple of years, been funding a liraglutide study, which is a type 2 diabetes drug for, um, uh, we're trying it for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and believe it or not, we're funding a Viagra-like study as well for vascular dementia in, in Tadalafil. And um, we didn't have much difficulty in finding participants <laughs> for that study. It's fully recruited now, by the way. Um, but there's, you know, real science behind this. Um, and there is a really novel approach to be taken. The drugs companies are less interested in it, so it's absolutely what we should be doing um, as a research charity. Um, and this can massively speed up the identification of new treatments. You know, we could, in as little as four or five years, identify a new treatment. So we're, gonna, we're trying as hard as we can to find something via this route. Um, 
And then our fourth priority, which is bringing new uh, ways of providing care and support for people um, with, uh, with dementia um, and their carers. Lots of examples of where we have done this already. And what's really important for us is, is the whole of this pathway. So taking research finally, that's great having something published, but it, it's as bad for care research as it is for biomedical research. We have to proactively push it through to the point where that intervention is moved into routine care. And I mentioned about the uniqueness of the society. We are perfectly placed, not just to be doing the research, but to be using our infrastructure, our reach, our skills and expertise internally, to be pushing things through that look to work and have an evidence base through to the point where it's having a difference to the lives of people affected by dementia today. And a couple of examples here on this slide, one around uh, uh, training programs for care homes um, and also uh, coping strategies for carers of people um, with dementia. Some real progress that we're, we're making here. And the jewel in the crown of our care work are our centres of excellence. We've got three of these centres of excellence that are funded, um, uh, announced last year and just starting um, this year. They're about £2 million worth of investment per centre um, and they're looking at creating a whole team of people that are working on one problem, one issue. So working in collaboration within that university and across other centres as well. The beauty of that is that we have this critical mass of people that can really get under the skin of the problem and, and hopefully find ways to overcome those issues. So they're going to be um, going on for the next five years and again we will be working very closely with them to translate their findings into real life differences for people affected by dementia. And of course then there's the UK Dementia Research Institute which is without doubt the most exciting thing happening in dementia research in the world at the moment. It's absolutely incredible. It's 250 million pounds of new money that's coming to dementia research. Alzheimer's Society is a founding funder. We've uh, pledged 50 million pounds to this initiative as a partnership with the Medical Research Council and another charity, ARUK. Um, and it's funding um, research across six centres in, uh, in the UK, mainly focused on biomedical research, but there is going to be a focus on care and technology research as well. What's great is that this is a beacon in the global dementia research space, and we are attracting people from across the world to come and work in the Dementia Research Institute. Um, and I was just on a visit with a couple of colleagues the, the other day up to uh, Cambridge. I went to Cardiff as well recently. And we're bringing people in from other fields, nothing to do with dementia, but they want to be applying their skills, their knowledge, their discoveries in the dementia setting. Now, they could, they could work in any disease area, but because of the Dementia Research Institute, they want to come and work in dementia and really help us speed up um, development of new treatments. So some really exciting things happening in the DRI. So hopefully, I've... <clears throat> during the course of, of the last sort of 30 minutes or so, been able to convince you that we're making a huge amount of progress in dementia and that the Alzheimer's Society is at the forefront of that. There's so much exciting stuff happening. And again, it's thank you to the support from all of you um, in this room that we we're able to, to make that possible, make the progress that we want to. Um, now, I wanted to just spend a couple more minutes before I finish on risk factors and prevention, because we always get asked lots of questions about this, and we're doing lots of research into this area. Um, and, uh, and you know, the killer question is, you know, what, what can we do in our lifestyles to try and reduce our risk of developing dementia? Well, the good news is, yes, we can prevent dementia. And we um, part funded a study that was published in The Lancet last year that showed that up to about third cases of dementia are potentially preventable. So there are modifiable risk factors, a number of them um, listed on this slide here, that we could do something about, which could delay onset of dementia or prevent dementia from uh, developing um, in, in the first place, which is, is a fantastic discovery. And it's something we absolutely need to be working on and need to be exploiting. Um, there's some early signs that actually this is working. So if we're looking at the numbers of people with dementia, um, the numbers haven't quite been increasing as much as we would have predicted based on population statistics, which is brilliant. And we think that's because it's the sort of post-Second World War generation coming through, had healthier lifestyles, ate more um, healthily and, and having that impact, which is great. So we need to understand that so we can exploit it a little bit more. Though we don't want to get complacent because <coughs> since then, We've all been affected by obesity, high levels of diabetes and heart disease. So that could cancel out what we've seen um, in the past. 
Um, but what's brilliant is that it does really look like we can have an impact through our lifestyles on our dementia risk. So what are the risk reduction top tips? Um, well, again, coming back to the headlines, I'm afraid blueberries won't do it. Um, one of your five a day, they're good. Um, wouldn't really call them a super fruit, but they're not really going to um, uh, cure or prevent uh, your dementia. Curry is often in the news, so that might um, uh, reduce your risk of dementia, but I'm afraid your chicken Danzac will not prevent dementia. Um, and one that I was really excited about, and was gutted, was champagne. Um, in that there was some research done in mice, and I'm not quite sure how they did the research with mini little champagne flutes, um, but it showed that potentially there's some ingredients in champagne that could reduce our risk of developing dementia. The research hasn't really gone on much further than that, it hasn't really been replicated, so I'm afraid um, I wouldn't go out and buy your Moe Chandon um, tomorrow. For that reason anyway, you may just want to have a drink, which would be nice. But yes, we, we don't think that it will reduce your risk of developing dementia. But there are some things where there's a lot of evidence. So we know that um, a healthy lifestyle, so being active, regular exercise, um, looking at not smoking, drinking moderately, so maybe the odd glass of red wine but not a bottle of red wine in a night. Um, but also diet is really important, so a healthy diet, but particularly um, the Mediterranean diet or even maybe the Nordic diet, they seem to be very, um, very strong in, in reducing risk of developing dementia. Um, and I'm quite partial to a roll mop, but if you ask me which diet I'd rather choose, I think I'm going to go south to Mediterranean. So. Hopefully I haven't offended any Scandinavians in the audience, but um, there's, there's a big impact on, on diet, but also getting other health conditions um, treated, like high blood pressure, like diabetes. All of these things can reduce our risk of developing dementia um, in later life. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of end with, with this slide here, and it, and it says, how can you unite against dementia? And you, you have your packs, but, but actually you are uniting against dementia already. You are our loyal supporters and we are incredibly grateful um, for your support. I mean hopefully the lecture this evening and, and do ask any questions that you've got but hopefully it's given you um, a bit more background to dementia and the various diseases that cause dementia. Hopefully it's given you more hope in, um, in dementia research that's out there. Lots of exciting things coming through but also reinforce that the Alzheimer's Society, your Alzheimer's Society, is absolutely at the centre of this effort in really pushing the boundaries of science. We're so optimistic about the future here. We're, we're discovering more quickly than we've ever discovered before. And we're very optimistic. You know, we've, we've had the comparisons throughout the lecture. If we look at cancer, what happened to cancer in, in the 60s, look what happened to HIV in the 80s and 90s. If we've got that political spotlight, if we've got that public support, and we see the levels of funding coming into the issue, particularly from a res research perspective, we will get the results and we will be able to defeat dementia by identifying ways of preventing, treating and curing in the future. So we're very optimistic, but thank you again for your support for making it possible. And thank you for listening.